That's what we learn from others. And this is important to continue happening. And I remember when I went to the University of Puerto Rico, I read Las Memorias de Bernardo Vega, The Memoirs of Bernardo Vega. That book impacted me. Bernardo, Bernardo Vega was a, a tobacco roller in New York at the beginning of the 20th, 20th century. Uh, but Bernardo told his story, but also told the story of family members that came to New York before him uh, and went all the way back to the time that Jose Martí and the Ministerio de Dances worked together in New York to build a movement for the independence of Puerto Rico and Cuba. Uh, so it was a group of, of, of intellectuals at, ta at that time. The, the tobacco rollers were like the intellectual groups of the, of the community. So in that, in that uh, tradition, uh, Manny did something similar on his book. Not only he shared his story, but he tell us his father's story as well. Uh, when I read the book, it impacted me when he wrote, I had never been to Puerto Rico, but it lived some in me. I'm sure that, there, that here in, in Orlando and other places around the country, there's a young man or woman experiencing that same feeling. That you have never been in Puerto Rico, you don't even speak the language, but Puerto Rico is in your heart. When you see that flag, that goes up, you know, like, like I heard the other day, uh, uh, what, is his name? what is his name, the Mexican uh, economist, Gabriel, Gabriel uh, he said, Puerto Ricans are crazy about the flag. And I'm like, you know what, it's true. We were crazy about the flag. Maybe because we have some troubles in the past with our flag. Maybe that's the reason. But anyhow, we're crazy about our flag. And, uh, and we share that with a lot of people. And that even when we are, we know that almost everyone speaks English, the Spanish come out and we start speaking Spanish uh, and, and all the way around too. So when you have a bunch of New Yorkers together, they start speaking Spanish, and then at one moment, boom, everyone starts speaking in English, and, and some, sometimes the people get like, what? <laughs> so this is the bilingualism. It is something that we create, that we, uh, that we, have, we have to protect, and by migrating to different places, we have to create the culture there. So uh, I know that I have some teachers uh, today with us. Thank you for keep pushing for that. Thank you for protecting the right of people to speak the, the mother language. Uh, mother tongue? Mm -hmm. That's what you, so I'm, I'm, sometimes I get confused. You know, it's patria is motherland, but in Spanish it should be like fatherland mm -hmm. because patria is the male. So uh, motherland. Uh, it's, motherland. it's motherland in English, but in Spanish it's patria, so it's, it's, it's a male, uh, in a way. So when we come and we learn the language, it gets some confusion sometimes. So anyhow, uh, today Mani is accompanied by his wife, Maria Ortiz, back there, and his son, Jose Hernandez Ortiz. Jose moved here with his mom a year ago, and loved to play basketball. And like his father, love to learn English. Also, he's going to introduce and read uh, his father's bio. And after that, Manuel is going to present his book. And after Manuel's presentation, uh, we're going to take questions from the audience. And if you are watching uh, via internet, you can send your questions uh, as well. So, Josué, go here.
Before we begin, I'd like to uh, first of all, first of all, give thanks to all of you for being here. And even before you were here, I have to give thanks to uh, the Creator of all things, right, uh, my God, and uh, Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior. I'd also like to thank each and every one of you for for making the sacrifice of, of sharing and spending your time with us this Saturday morning. You know, Saturday mornings are what they are. Saturday mornings, and. Uh, just uh, knowing that you're here to spend an hour, 30 minutes, an hour and a half with my family here today is, uh, is a recognition of, of, of your friendship, your respect. And those of you that I'm meeting for the first time, I really, really appreciate the fact that you took of your time to, to spend time and, and, and listen to what I'd like to share with you today. Uh, also to the internet, I'd like to say, uh, Hello to my, uh, my oldest son, uh, Joey, who's in Puerto Rico. Uh, my mother, I don't know if she's watching, if she is. My sisters, and to all those that connected themselves to the internet, thank you for listening. Uh, probably some of my students, too, are connected today, uh, this morning. The birth of a weekend, the birth of a weekend, the migration cycle repeats itself. The birth of a weekend, the migration cycle repeats itself. So the birth of a weekend is a story of the great Puerto Rico, Puerto Rican migration after World War II to New York City, Chicago, Philadelphia, Hartford, and New York. And the subtopic, the migration cycle repeats itself, is where I make the connection to the current migration in the uh, 1990s to the present day. The bridge, the Tappan Zee Bridge. The Tappan Zee Bridge is a bridge that, that, is, uh, that, I, that every day of my childhood years, I had the privilege of, of looking out the window, walking across the street, and being able to see the bridge. I grew up in a very small town right here on the outskirts of, 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 of New York, of uh, the Tappan Zee Bridge is called Tarrytown. And uh, it's interesting, my parents actually, uh, were part of that great migration wave. And they met in Brooklyn, and my father was part of an auto automotive program at General Motors, and they decided that Tarrytown was that town that, that needed to settle in to begin a new family. So they met in Brooklyn in the 1950s, and I was born early in the 1960s. So the birth of Rican is a story of, of that Puerto Rican that traveled uh, one of hundreds of thousands uh, probably, probably reached million or millions uh, after World War II and settled in these cities. And the connection and the relevance of the book today is what the book kind of uh, mirrored that was going to happen and is happening today in Central Florida. Nelson Mandela, education is the single most powerful weapon in the world. Uh, that's one of my favorite quotes, right? Uh, education is the single most powerful weapon in the world. Now, Mr. Mandela, uh, incarcerated uh, for 27 years, he believed in he believed in the in, in the right to bear arms, not only to bear arms but to use them to defend himself from what was happening in South Africa 
uh, during the time. But he learned in that peaceful atmosphere in the libraries and, and of, 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 of those 27 years inside that prison cell that education is the single most powerful weapon. So instead of that weapon, you learn that education is that weapon. And many Puerto Ricans and Hispanics have understood and have learned that it is the single most powerful weapon in the world. And the birth of a Rican is the story of the education of Puerto Ricans. It's the story of the education of Puerto Ricans. Now, the, uh, the, the birth of a Rican is a, uh, is a semi-autobio, right? And it's seven chapters. So what I'm going to do with you this morning is I'm going to go, I'm going to go over each chapter, and with each chapter, I'm going to be making a connection to what's happening today, all right? Uh, so the first chapter is a typical American boy, a typical American boy. That's who I am, right? A Southern Puerto Rican migrant who came to New York City in the 1950s. Now, why did they come? They came, there were mixed economic and political factors. History uh, taught us that uh, Operation Bootstrap, uh, you know, and the specific policies by the government of the time created a, the, 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 the atmosphere, the, 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 the factors that led to that migration. So my parents, coming from, uh, my mother was part of a huge family, uh, 15 of them, and uh, my mother's actually number, number five, uh, number six of the 15. The first three died of malnutrition in, in the 1920s and 1930s. My mother was born in 1940. And uh, she came from that huge family. Uh, my grandfather decided to uh, leave the family. And so my, my grandmother was left with to bring up 12 children all by herself. 12. A single mother uh, in Puerto Rico in the 1930s. Now I'm going to read to you uh, some passages from the book that will give you the, uh, some idea of, of how this book is, is relevant today. In, uh, there's, there's a, in the book, there's a prologue. And uh, interestingly enough, this morning, I was going over the prologue. And there's a paragraph that uh, a pastor friend of mine, uh, his name is Carlos Cintron, he wrote the prologue. And, and I'm going to read it out loud. It says, a half a century later, history is repeating itself. And many Puerto Rican families are leaving to the States looking for better opportunities. They will have to make similar adjustments, and the ones that remain living on the island will not understand their decisions and their cultural changes. This is why this book is so important at this particular moment in time. So the book is giving us uh, a reflection of the past and uh, constructing a bridge towards the present to what is happening today. Uh, so, what do we know about New York in the 50s? Some of us uh, uh, that are in the audience today know what I'm talking about. Those of you that don't know, well, Puerto Ricans made New York their own. And on page 17, it says, during the summers, El Barrio came alive with the sounds of La Isla del Encanto, Puerto Rico's nickname. Puerto Ricans brought their music, food, and traditions with them to New York. The breathtaking smell of rice and beans, I wrote on Sancocho and Frituras, traditional Puerto Rican foods, filled the air and the sounds of Tito Rodriguez, Machito, and a young mambo king by the name of Tito Puente were common fixtures in El Barrio. Puerto Rican flags were displayed on balconies, cars, and window apartments. Men played dominoes outside, women gathered in apartments to talk gossip and share family life experiences. For some inexplicable reason, Manolín, who's my father, thought he was still living in Puerto Rico. And this is the story of my father at this point, right? So I'm sure that this probably happened to you. Uh, it's, it's interesting that one of the major differences that I had uh, in this experience is that as living in, in New York, you would wake up in the morning and you never knew if it was Puerto Rico or, or New York. Am I the only one? Uh, and it's because of the connection that wherever you went, you would see the flag, you see with the food, the people talking about New York. It got cold in the winter, you saw the snow, the ice. You had to take the train, if you took the train, but you had that connection to the island. Today, even here in Central Florida, we're, we want to keep Puerto Rico and Barrio alive. We want to keep our traditions alive. And now we have all these rest, <coughs> restaurants and, and, 
and all these other places that have come here to settle down and share the food, the traditions, the music, and the culture with people here uh, in uh, Central Florida. So you had mixed economic and political factors. Hundreds of thousands settled in New York, Chicago, Philadelphia, Philadelphia and New York. Conditions in Puerto Rico were, 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 were horrible. Uh, they were horrible, and, uh, and so that's why they came down here, right? I'm just going to read a, a paragraph that I dedicate to my uncle. My uncle is, is the oldest, was the oldest of the 12 that survived. And uh, I'm just going to share a little bit here. It says, Coming Gloria Carmona, my mother, came to New York in the early 1950s. Her mother, Carmelita, gave birth to 15 children, but the first three died of malnutrition. After the first three died, then came Pepe, Isabel, and my mother, Carmen. The 1930s were difficult economic times for Puerto Rico. The island's economy was mainly dependent on the production of sugar cane and coffee. The sugar industry left workers unemployed during periods in between harvests, and there was a lot of competition from Hawaii and other Caribbean islands. Workers became unemployed for periods up to six months during the year, unemployment period between harvests, and American farmers announced their packages. So we actually had American farmers coming to the islands. It was a big thing, you know, you had these, today we have these job fairs. Back then you had these big uh, job fairs and you had uh, American corporations, American farmers uh, making the best of what they could do to promote uh, jobs in these cities and many of the people that we know, many of our parents, grandparents, many of our great uncles that settled in New York City, when they got there, it was not what they had offered them. Uh, a little bit of that is happening today, here as well. Grandpa Alfredo was an alcoholic and a womanizer. He had a rep hell of a reputation. My grandmother wanted babies, so she got 15 of them. By the time Carmelita gave birth to her 15th child, he had already moved in with a younger woman. The first three kids died of malnutrition. Carmelita brought up 12 kids alone. The firstborn, Pepe, went fishing uh, to help went fishing to help feed the family. Even as a 12-year-old boy, Pepe was a living legend. This is dedicated to my uncle Pepe. He was able to catch more than 40 dozens of them in one day. Carmelita saw her son's talent as a blessing sent from God when there was nothing on the family plate for his younger brothers and sisters. Pepe would, go, would leap out of his seat and run to the seacoast. An hour later, he would come back with a dozen crabs for supper. So these were some of the conditions that uh, kind of uh, motivated, if we could call it, we could say motivated, uh, not only my, my mother's family and my father's family to, 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 to make the trip, to make the journey to New York City. Now, so I was born in, I was born and I grew up in Tarrytown, right? Now, growing up in two worlds, growing up in two worlds, when you grow up in two worlds, you know, you're bilingual, you're bicultural, you speak two languages, and uh, the languages, the culture, they're right inside of you. I mean, it's an expression that you feel that you can't get away from. You know, you speak English, you speak Spanish, you have no problems with that. And sometimes people don't understand that. That has become a problem today here in, in Central Florida. I mean, in, in schools where I'm a teacher, they want students to learn English. And by the way, I am an English teacher, language arts teacher. So I do want my students to learn English and master the skills that are necessary, right? On the other hand, we cannot deny the fact that we cannot get away, we cannot separate ourselves from our, from our Spanish language because it's, it's intrinsically related to who we are. It's in our bones, it's in our veins, it's what we are and what we do. So, Living in, living in two worlds is a, is a process. Now, interestingly enough, you know, I spoke English at school, but Spanish was the primary language in my house at that church. Uh, I'd like to call my son one more time. Come over here. All right? So at home, at home, uh, my parents spoke Spanish. My parents spoke Spanish at home. And we went to church, so in, in church it was Spanish as well. But when, when we left the door, it was all about English. 
and it was it was it was kind of a the transfer was simple. You <coughs> left the door English, you came back home Spanish, and it, it was just it's just the way it was, and you loved that. You know, you left the door and you had the hamburger and the hot dog. Just to mention, you know, <coughs> the, the typical junk, the junk food uh, and, and, and school lunch as well. Uh, then you went back home and it was uh, arroz con habichuelas, rice and beans. Uh, so thank you, Josue. So it was that kind of experience. Many of our students today are living the same kind of experience here in Central Florida. You know, they're in school and they have to learn English. When I say they have to, they have to. Uh, but when they leave that door, sometimes when they leave the classroom, sometimes when they come in the classroom, they can't get away from Spanish <coughs> because it's part of who they are and what they do. So it's, it's a similar experience. That's the connection. That's the bridge. That's the bridge of, of the current experience. Now. Maggie, I have one quick thing. Go ahead. In the 50s, growing up in New York, it was watch TV, the black and white TV, <coughs> and learn that English language because everything was in English on the TV. So when your parents spoke to you in Spanish, but you had the TV to relate to, what is it uh, that you relate, you know, what products or everything that you're going back to school. So the TV was a mode of learning English while you were at home. In the, I know in my family, that's what it was. Yeah, and, and today the internet, right? The students have so many other tools, uh, but now today we have all these Spanish channels especially in Central Florida. So when many of these kids come home, their parents are watching the other Spanish television channels, right? Now, my experience in New York growing up was very interesting. As I said, it was, it was, a, it was a bicultural, bilingual. Uh, the New York experience, I'll talk about it in a moment. Uh, my father, uh, when I was 11 and a half, he made a huge announcement to the family. And so, you know, we had that family meeting, and, and he said, you know, uh, my father was, he grew up, he was asthmatic, diabetic, heart problems. He had all kinds of situations, all kinds of health issues. He was in mid-30s, mid and so his doctor advised that he, if he wanted to live an extra 15, 15 years, and thank God we got him for another almost 40 years, he had to move to a warmer climate. So right there he said, we're moving to Puerto Rico. It's our homeland. I was the oldest. I have three sisters, uh, Elba, Lillian, and Cynthia. And uh, I remember looking at my sisters and my mother, our homeland. You know, you, you knew about Puerto Rico, but it, you know, it, 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 it wasn't real. We, went, we would go to Puerto Rico on vacation, but for me it was all the beaches and, 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 and my grandmother's house. But actually moving to Puerto Rico was a different thing. And, uh, it's interesting because my mother, when she would sing at home a lot, and one of the songs that she would sing is En Mi Viejo San Juan. And En Mi Viejo San Juan is a classic by Noel Estrada. But you know, I never learned the, 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 the Spanish version, but I learned the Spanish version. <laughs> the, Spanish, the Spanish version is, is written by a poet, his name is Pedro Pietri. Pedro Pietri is a diehard New York poet. Uh, which started the New York poetry uh, experience in the barrio and, and around the world. And so he took and Mi Viejo San Juan and he translated it into Spanglish. As a matter of fact, that and Mi Viejo San Juan in Spanglish has been translated in several different languages. <laughs> so I'm going to share a little bit with you uh, this morning. In my Viejo San Juan, this is Mi Viejo San Juan in Spanglish. They raised their price of bun. So I fly to Manhattan, Orlando. It is there that I swear everyone to welfare, especially the Latins, to a barrio, to a barrio, to see me. I went in pursuit of Laurent in a five-room apartment, one room, two bedroom with families here in Central Florida, where my neighbors will be Puerto Ricans like me, 
dressed in tropical garments. I know, I know, I know, I'll miss Puerto Rico. That's just a little uh, piece of Emiliano someone in Spanish. So my, my, my mother would sing it in, 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 in Spanish, and later I made the connection in Spanish, right? It's interesting because that song, can, you know, Puerto Ricans and, and sing it because it, connect, it connects with the island. It reminds them of the island, right? And it's, it's like you're in New York or you're in Central Florida and you would like to be back in Puerto Rico, but this is where you are. You know you're not going there, but you're here. You're here, but you want to go there. That's the revolving door. Okay? Now, so my father makes the announcement. Nos vamos para la isla. So, you know, we, we, we made it to, uh, to uh, we moved to New York in 1974. I was 11 and a half years old. And uh, for me, it was, it was traumatic. And, uh, but, you know, out of respect to my father, I, I kept quiet. I was the quiet, rebellious type. You know what I mean? I didn't, do, I didn't go into the streets, I didn't do this, I didn't do that. I was quiet, I was rebellious, I was very respectful of my parents because I observed his sacrifice and I kind of admired that. Uh, but a lot of interesting things happened to me in Puerto Rico. When we were in Puerto Rico, the, ver the, very, first, uh, the very first day in school, uh, I go into school and, and, and I hear the word New Yorican for the first time. So I never heard the word in New York. I heard it in Puerto Rico. You know, <laughs> and, yeah, I'm in school and every, I, hear, I hear the whispers, New York, New York. And I'm like, what's that? So you know, I'm walking. Now I was a big kid. I was a big, New York, New York. I heard another word too, Gringo. Gringo, and I'm like, Gringo, Gringo? <laughs> So, you know, I, I couldn't make the connection. I, I, was, I was totally dazed and, and shocked. Uh, now, another thing happened to me, and this is in the book, The Birth of the Regan. Those of you who don't have it, you should, you should uh, get a copy today. Uh, another thing happened to me the very first day, and that is that uh, the teacher asked me what my name was. She said, uh, what is your name? ¿Cuál es tu nombre? And I said, my name is uh, Manuel, and I pronounce it in Spanish, you know, Manuel Hernandez. She said, that's not your name. I'm like, and everybody started laughing. And I'm like, oh, what's my name? What is, what is tu nombre? Manuel Hernandez. Esto no es tu nombre. And I'm like, what's going on? What is your name? Manuel Hernandez. Eso no es tu nombre. Eso es una falta de respeto. And I'm like, oh, and everybody laughing. And I'm like, uh, ¿cómo se llama tu mamá? And Carmen Carmona. Tu nombre es Manuel Hernández Calmona. Yeah. So I said, that's not my name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not my name. So uh, I'm going to read from a book something about that. It says, these were new terms for me. I didn't have a clue what those words meant. That, you know, someone told me that gringo was because I had moved from the United States. And New Oregon was supposed to be meant that was half Puerto Rican and half New Rican or something like that. Uh, my homeroom teacher, my homeroom teacher, uh, she, she called me, uh, she asked me, ¿Cuál es tu segundo apellido? I was dumbfounded. And then you see in the United States, my mother's last name was never needed, mentioned or asked for in school. In Puerto Rico, second last name was a must. But my teacher asked for my mother was and immediately knew that it was Calmona. I hated it. Now, out of respect to my mother, I love my mother, and I love that name, but, you know, I, I had never, I I'd never had an experience with that name. I had nothing against my mother's last name, but it was new for me, and I didn't like the sound of it. For me, Calmona was half car and half Mona, female monkey. <laughs> you know, car and Mona? Car and Mona? All right? So, so that's my, uh, that's that story there, all right? Now. So my son today, my son today, Josue, is growing up in a, in a, in a similar world. Uh, and not only my son, Josue, but thousands of students coming into schools here in Central Florida. You know, uh, uh, I was, uh, now I'm a teacher, and it's interesting because uh, 
So I, I sometimes mispronounce the names of my Hispanic students. Uh, for example, there's a student, her name is uh, Valeria. So I, I, at the beginning, I called her Valerie. And I, you, I don't know what is it with me and names. Uh, you know how nobody, nobody likes, you, you, like, you don't like anyone messing with your name. So now I'm a, I'm a teacher, and I'm messing with names. So you know, it's, 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 it's very funny, because uh, I remember a student, I remember she didn't tell me, because she's very quiet, but her friend told me, Ella no se llama uh, Valerie. Su nombre es Valeria. I said, oh my god. I, I said, I apologize. So I, I call her Valeria, you know, Valeria. So it, it's, it's an interesting thing. It's an interesting thing, right? So now there's one thing about the birth of the Rican uh, that I connect a lot to, and that is education. Education. Uh, uh, we, we, our kids today come to Central Florida and I, you know, there, there are a lot of situations in schools, but our schools, our students, they want an education. You know, they want to get ahead. They, 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 want to, they want to graduate from high school. They want to go to college. So they want that education. So now with me, with me, uh, it took, I had a personal experience when I was 15 years old. Things got so bad at home, and that's in the book as well, that at 15, I had to leave Puerto Rico and go back to New York. So at 15 years of age, I worked in factories in Brooklyn. Uh, and uh, so I was in Brooklyn working in factories. So that experience, you know, so I was introduced to the world of the underworld of working in factories. I don't know if some of you know what I'm talking about. Because I was in that factory, and it was like, you know, there was the drugs and the, you know, so many things happened in that factory, inside and outside. And here's a 15-year-old introduced to that kind of world, you know, and I didn't want to be part of it. So I'm sure that many of our kids today in Central Florida are, are part-time jobs, and they've also been introduced. But working in a factory really gave me a, a, a connection with, I, I needed to get an education. You know, I remember one of the most humiliating things that I observed was that, you know, you, you had to clock in, remember that, the, the big clock, <laughs> with the big cards? And uh, the boss would stand on line, and sometimes he would come up to the women, and he would spank them, you know, like it, in the butt. And I was like, I was in the back of the line, and they would do like this, and I would say, I would feel like crying. That's an insult. But they would, they would keep quiet because it was the boss. And that's just one, just one little thing that I observed. I observed so many other things. Uh, my friend, uh, uh, Peter and Geeky, I hope they're still alive. Uh, they were high on you know, rush and, and crack and coke. And it, it was just incredible what was happening in the 70s. And instead, uh, I thank God for my father's prayers. <laughs> Because instead of getting into that world, I would, I would stray away from it. I, you know, I was invited, and I wouldn't go. I was told, would you like to come to a party? I said, I got something else to do. 